So Tim, thanks for your time and welcome back to CNBC. Good to be here. So the UK has just removed the UAE from its quarantine list. How significant is this decision? And can you give us some insights into just how important this segment is for Emirates? Well, uh, in answer to the first question, uh, the last question first, uh, the UK market is probably one of our most important markets for Dubai in itself. Uh, it represents probably the largest uh, segment outside the uh, Gulf Cooperation Council uh, countries uh, in terms of inbound tourism for Dubai. So, of course, this is hugely significant. Uh, the government's been working for about five months to try and persuade the United Kingdom government that uh, we should be uh, put onto their list. Uh, that happened on Thursday, I'm pleased to say. And already we're experiencing uh, quite an uh, increase in the booking velocity in our systems with regard to people coming out to Dubai from the United Kingdom post the 2nd of December after lockdown finishes. So uh, it, it'll be, a, a, I think, a major boost to tourism and general travel between the two countries. Do you think this is going to go far enough to put travel demand back in the right direction for you, though? Well, of course it will. Um, it much will depend on, on how the pandemic is dealt with in the United Kingdom. Um, and one assumes that after the 2nd of December, there will be no further lockdowns. Uh, whether or not that will uh, remove the requirements of the, of the United Kingdom government with regard to other countries, I have no idea. But eventually, um, we hope that the UAE-UK corridor will, will be in place indefinitely until such time as the vaccine is rolled out and we can get things back to normal. So give me some insight into this decision as well, because as you pointed out, you mentioned that the government has been working hard on securing this agreement, but the UK is in the middle of its second lockdown. We're seeing additional lockdowns across Europe now. The numbers in the United States are going in the absolutely wrong direction. And it just seems like the virus is still very much in control. So why do you think now is the right time to start opening up these corridors? And could this potentially put the UAE's virus recovery at risk? No, I don't think so. I, I think as far as the United Kingdom government is concerned, they've, they've established to their own satisfaction that the, the way the United Arab Emirates government went about its business in March and April to try and control, track and trace uh, and isolate this uh, virus was, was actually world class. It, uh, in many respects, the UAE um, did a lot of things that many countries did subsequently, uh, quite a lot later. Um, since then, they have managed to con control it, contain it. And I think the metrics that the UAE government provided to the uh, uh, UK government with regard to the number of people hospitalized, the number of people in ICU, the number of deaths, the number of ongoing infections were sufficiently um, strong enough for them to put uh, uh, the UA on the list. Now then, as far as the UN, UK is concerned and the, the way the pandemic is, is continuing to cause problems, not just in the UK and everywhere else, I think the UAE is very, certainly Dubai is very alive to the risk and therefore they will be uh, uh, enforcing, if you can use that word, the protocols that they have been doing for some time. And they're very good at doing, whether that be uh, social distancing, mask wearing, uh, PCR tests on arrival in, into to the country, uh, and providing that is negative, there are no quarantine requirements. Um, and they will continue to, to uh, enforce, it's, it's a strong word, but, but basically ensure that the, there is a high level of risk mitigation with regard to uh, virus um, uh, uh, spreading in, in the community here. So, um, so far so good. They've done a very good job. The uh, Emirates, certainly Dubai and UAE has been open since the 7th of July to many countries. And the airline has benefited from the movement of people across our network. And we haven't seen a spike at all in um, in the uh, meaningful spike, I should say, in, in infection rates, hospitalization, uh, ICU or deaths. So again, it's still a very good story. So we represent that it's a safe place to come here as best we can. Uh, the, uh, the, the British government, as far as containing and controlling the virus with regard to the lockdown, uh, I think eventually will work. Uh, I think the uh, the R number will fall below one if it already hasn't. 
And I think probably during the course of December, they'll see themselves uh, see possible light at the end of this terrible tunnel that we're all in. I, I, I remain optimistic that this, there will be other corridors opening up as, as, the, as we get this thing under control. We will get it under control. It's just taking a little bit longer than everybody had thought, and it's not without its difficulties. And I'm, I'm not trying to belittle that. I'm simply saying we have to get through this. Uh, as far as we are concerned in, in Dubai and the UAE, we were on the uh, first step of trying to bring back people back into this, this, in the case of Dubai, a fabulous waterfront city, which has everything to offer, um, particularly at this time of year when the weather is so brilliant. So uh, we're hoping that uh, people will feel that they, they can come here, return without any risk of the uh, country being taken off the list and having to race back to be the lockdown guillotine, because I don't think that's going to happen. So we, are, we expect this to continue and grow. So what's the next step when it comes to the opening up? How are you going to restore operations across the network and open up additional corridors from this point on in a safe manner? Well, at the moment, we have the whole of our 777 fleet, 151 aircraft operating in another number of different modes, but many of those are already carrying passengers across a network, which now has 104 cities restored. Uh, so we're actually doing fairly well. Now, the, the protocols with regard to the carrying of the passengers in flight have been uh, designed by us for us. They are already the, the talk of much of the, of the industry with regard to the, the, uh, the, the, the kind of uniforms that the crew are working, the distances they, they are, are keeping with regard to the interaction with passengers, but at the same time delivering an incredibly good job. Um, so uh, pe people are recognizing, of course, the aircraft aren't completely full and therefore we are able to socially distance people on flights, um, keep the crew well protected with all the uh, PPE that they're wearing and are still doing a good standard of service. And that's worked across the whole network. Uh, at the same time, we've been filling the, uh, the holds of the aircraft and in some cases the passenger cabins with freight, uh, which has given us uh, an enormous cash fillet with regard to um, the uh, situation we were looking at back in March and April. Mm -hmm. And as, this, as we see the decline of the pandemic through the application, one hopes, of the vaccine over the next uh, six to nine months, uh, we believe that things will restore themselves uh, fairly quickly. I'm not one of these people who believes that it's going to take a long time or that it won't come back in the way that it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 you know, I tend to believe that we will be as good as we were in the pre-COVID days as an airline. So you said previously that it will be 2022 before we see demands returning to pre-COVID levels. Does this recent vaccine news perhaps change that timeline for you? No, no, I think it is because we are going to have the vaccine introduced during the course of 21. Uh, in, in, I think in large numbers or as fast as these farmers can produce them, that we are able to say that during the winter of next year, in the last quarter calendar, October, November, December, through the early part of 21, that we will see a restoration of global demand and hopefully the capacity to meet the global demand uh, with the likes of Emirates and others. Um, so that's what I've always said. I've never uh, deluded myself to believe that we would start earlier than that, simply because the, the logistics of distribution of a vaccine of this nature, uh, given the conditions under which it has to be shipped, is going to be a challenge for the for the industry, whether it be air, shipping, land, or whatever. So that'll take time. And uh, bearing in mind that the Pfizer vaccine requires two vaccines to be administered to an individual, um, it compounds the, the difficulty of distribution. But we'll get over it. We always do. And there is a there's a global imperative to get this done as quickly as possible and as fairly and reasonably as possible so that everybody gets an opportunity to have it, not just in the West, but also in the developing world. So what is your working assumption on when we are going to have a scalable vaccine available globally? Because this is going to have a critical impact on the business that you're running. Of course it is. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't profess to be an expert in how the pharmaceutical companies will, one, get the, the vaccine to market, having gone through the rigours of... Uh, of testing uh, by the regulators in their various countries. But I do know that the, there are difficulties in the transportation, particularly of the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be shipped at 
uh, a very low sub-zero temperatures and maintained at that prior to uh, distribution. And, and that, that is in itself quite a difficult thing for us all to do. We're all working on it. Uh, the industry is trying to establish best practice involving the third party supply chain in the whole of this logistical exercise to ensure that we can get them to the markets that need them so badly. And basically that's just, that's just the whole planet. Um, so as long as we can get that under control and if more vaccines come to market, which perhaps are not so onerous with regard to their transportation conditions, i.e. they can be transported at say minus 10 or minus five degrees centigrade, then we've got a better chance of getting them out sooner. But certainly at the moment, we're working on trying to move this Pfizer vaccine um, in, in specially designed containers uh, on our planes, in our holds and in the cabins, and keeping them at that level through the, uh, through the distribution point, which we're, as you probably heard, we have a very uh, well-equipped center, both at Dubai Airport and at the airfield in the south, Dubai World Central, which had already geared itself up to major ph pharmaceutical transshipments. So we have the chillers, we have the freezers, we have the logistical control for the airline to get these these uh, vaccines into multiple parts of the world where others cannot do that. So we're rather hoping, and we're already engaged with most of the pharmaceutical companies to do just that. So Emirates is going to be playing a critical role in getting that vaccine around the world. So Tim, I also wanted to ask you about the financial impact of the pandemic. This is something you've spoken a lot about this year, but. Of course, in the news recently, we've seen that Emirates has just reported its first loss in about 30 years, obviously unavoidable in this extremely challenging operating environment. But as you move forward, are you going to have to adjust the scale of what Emirates is and how it does business post pandemic? No, I don't think so at all. I think we've got to tough it out. Um, we have arrested the cash outflow by having all these, air, these 777s flying. I'm not saying it hasn't stopped it. It, has, it, it. it continues to be a problem to us. After all, we have 115 380s sitting on the ground doing very little. Um, and most of those are on debt. So we have to service the debt and we get no relief from the debt providers with regard to our obligations. So we're going to have to do that, but I, I, I believe that once we get through this, that we will re reactivate the fleet sooner rather than later and get a cash positive operation again sooner rather than later. And I'm hoping that really takes place um, during the course of the summer of this year and gets us into reasonable condition in the, in the first quarter of next year. That being the case, and providing our, our cash position uh, tracks where we think it will be and what it is currently doing, in fact, we're, we're, we're doing better than that. We thought we would uh, be, notwithstanding the the, uh, the loss situation that happened in the first six months. Cash is king. As long as we can keep our cash situation in good shape, we believe that we'll be ready to uh, re-enter the markets as well and as large as we always did. Um, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm not one of these people who believe that the, the nature of demand, the shape of demand, the segmentation of demand is going to change. It is just one of those things that we will deal with. It's a major disruption, probably the worst we've ever had. But goodness me, we have the, the wherewithal to try and get ourselves through it and get going again as soon as possible. And I believe that demand will return to pre-COVID levels sooner than anybody else is thinking that they will. Hmm. So can you put a timeline on this return to profitability, though? Give me a date. Well, I, I would think that in the... In the um, the year 22-23, and for us that is uh, uh, starting the 1st of April 22, uh, in that year we will return to profitability. We will certainly be cash positive during the course, the back end of next year, returning to profitability in 22-23. Now, that is what I see at the moment. There are a lot of things that can change that, of course, as we all know, because we are an international company trading on the uh, the, the whole of the, uh, the world's uh, operations. And so anything can change all of that. But at the moment, um, I, I believe that within the next 18 months, two years, we will return ourselves to profitability. And you've had great support from the government in this journey as well. Are you going to require additional financial assistance? Well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, that time will tell on that. Um, what I will say is that the government are fully aware of the criticality of what we do. 
Um, I talk about this wonderful city that is so open and such a great place for tourists to come to. They, they need the tourists, they need people here. They recognize the aviation sector is vital to all of that. Um, that's not to say that they're just going to throw money at the company. We are, we are required as management to ensure that the equity injection is minimized as best possible. Um, and and we're, we're onto it, but they are hugely supportive of what we do. Uh, and I believe will remain so for uh, as long as it takes. So what's your outlook for the Dubai economy coming into 2021? And do you think the IMF's forecast of 1.3% growth makes sense here, given the trajectory of the virus and how you're assessing economic and business conditions as it stands? I don't see why, if the conditions and constraints, this isn't about Dubai restricting people or any or trade, we are very much in the hands of what goes on in the outside world. Uh, but I believe as those restrictions start to fall and Dubai has positioned itself to be able to uh, get the economy going very quickly, uh, the government has continued to invest in infrastructure. The private sector, believe it or not, has continued to invest in many new projects. The primary segments of the economy, whether it be uh, real estate, whether it be banking, uh, media, internet, computing, etc., continues at pace here. So, you know, they, they, they like all countries and all cities, uh, are faced with the same problem. But I believe that uh, Dubai will be very quick to respond and very quick to get the benefits of the global economy as it emerges uh, from this. And that's why we are so determined as the airline to meet the needs of the Emirates and Dubai to get the job done so they, they can then kickstart it. So, is it 1.2? Is it 1.5? Uh, is it 1? I can't be sure, but I'm confident that, that they will do the right thing to ensure that they certainly get things going back to where they used to be as soon as possible. Mm. One thing we also like to ask you is your outlook for oil prices as well. This is a really important cost input for your business. Do you think that perhaps sub 50 USD oil is here to stay through 2021? Yes, I do. Um, I think uh, the global economy is going to take time to get out of this, this particular state. Demand for oil, of course, much will be conditioned by the supply. But however hard the cartel tries to keep the price up and supply uh, match with that, it's, it's all in the hands of the consumers uh, across the planet. And at the moment, there are, it's a bit patchy. So long as it's patchy and uh, oil supply com continues to be robust, it's likely that the price will be in the 40 to $50 uh, price level through the course of 21. That's the way I think it would be. And that, of course, as you rightly say, gives us an interplane price which allows us to operate profitably um, and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully in, in both a p &L situation and from the cash point of view. And so, Tim, on another topic as well, one major breakthrough we've seen geopolitically this year is the rapprochement between the UAE and Israel. What's the opportunity for Emirates here? Do you see perhaps an opportunity to open up new routes? Do you see opportunity for new business ties? How is this going to play out from your angle? Well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, when the government of the United Arab, Arab Emirates established this, this relationship with Israel, that they certainly had in mind um, business, uh, travel. Uh, it is clear in the, in the month that, or two that this relationship has been in existence. There is a, a, a very strong demand uh, from Israel uh, into what's going on in the United Arab Emirates. As far as we're concerned in the airline, the uh, likelihood of, of uh, the Israeli uh, origin passengers moving across our network into other parts of our network is, is clear and present. So we are just deciding how best to go about that. Um, and as you probably know, there are going to be a number of uh, carriers starting towards the end of this month, the beginning of next month, uh, three from Israel and possibly by Dubai from, um, from Dubai. So. Uh, everybody's expecting quite a lot of business activity, quite a lot of tourist activity as the two countries mesh the new relationship. And just finally, Sir Tim, before we let you go, it's been a really challenging year for every airline CEO. Really simple question for you. How are you holding up? How are you feeling? Well, I, you know, battered in the early, early months like everybody was. Uh, when we had to ground the airline for two months, 
Uh, that's uh, unprecedented and certainly my long career in this business never seen anything like it. Um, and it was a, a psychological blow, actually, just as well as what's a physical blow. Uh, but, um, you know, within a very short space of time, we got our, our fleet going. Uh, we got the freighter boys working flat out cargo uh, and, and gradually got things back onto an even keel at a time when we, we really had to downsize the workforce, which was probably the most difficult thing we've had to do in the business. Uh, we've been through m multiple crises since uh, we've been established, but dealing with a reduced workforce, having to let people go was probably the most difficult thing any of us have ever done, certainly on the scale that we had to do. Um, actually, I'm rather hoping we can bring some of those back fairly soon. But um, yeah, it's been tough, uh, but it's been no tougher for people in Emirates and Dubai than it has been for other major carriers who are, who are deeply stricken by what has happened. So the whole of the airline industry is, is, uh, is in, a, in, in a shocked and stunned state, but you know, it's a resilient business. They bounce back, all right, there will be casualties and may not be so many players at the end of the day, but goodness me, it's, uh, it's really, it's been a tough uh, industry in terms of its resilience and its uh, response to global, regional, whatever, uh, things that have happened in the past. It's always bounced back, and I'm confident that it will, and that the CEOs of the of today and the future will be able to react and guide the, the business through. Well, Sir Sam, wish you all the best on the recovery path from here. Thanks so much for joining us again on CNBC. You're welcome. Thanks.